I'm Ken Rockwell. Let's take a look at Nikon's $8,000, 4.5-pound, 2-kilogram, 58mm f0.95 Noct. Now, when this first was announced, I thought it was the dumbest thing ever because it was a giant lens. It really only works well in a tripod, and it's only manual focus. It's got this huge manual focus ring. There's no autofocus, which makes it a totally impractical lens. And so at that time, I lambasted it, saying it was a foolish thing. Who would ever want this? Because you can't shoot it handheld at f095. And the reason for that simply is, as you just breathe and move back and forth a little bit, unless you're shooting close to infinity, your depth of field is so vapor thin that you'll lose focus, you'll lose sharpness, and completely destroy the whole point of this lens. So it really is a tripod lens. But when I actually got one, then I realized entirely this is not a consumer lens. This is a commercial grade lens intended for purchase by organizations, things like art museums, forensics departments, astronomy departments, national governments, and so forth, because of its extraordinary optics. It is exceedingly sharp, even at 0.95. It has a very flat field. Its optical design optimizes itself as it's focused for each distance. It has no distortion. And therefore, it is fantastic for shooting on a tripod for things that matter. For instance, for documenting works of fine art. If you're trying to photograph works of fine art, essentially anything bigger than about 5 by 7 inches, you can photograph with this lens. It doesn't get closer. It's not a macro lens, but for artwork smaller than that, you put it in a scanner. Anything else you might want to document, construction sites and so forth, intelligence gathering, this is extraordinary. You put it in a tripod, you can get extremely precise focus with this manual focus ring, and you can get the results that you deserve. But let's take a quick look at some of the pictures it can make. Just understand, this is not a consumer lens that you're supposed to buy and go out and willy-nilly shoot handheld like some kid on YouTube. It's something you put on a tripod. So if you're a guy who never leaves the house without his really right stuff tripod and his Arca Swiss ball head and everything else, this lens is for you. If you just want to make happy snaps, honestly, I'll get into this later. But then what you really want is this lens. It's one quarter the price and half the weight. It's the f1.2 50mm, which is autofocus and a much more practical lens for actual handheld shooting. But let's take a look at some of the pictures. Here's a picture of a fountain. This is at f0.95 in, well, the afternoon. I'm going to zoom in here. Now, this is a video zoom using my editing software on the still image. This is not a video image. This is simply the shot that came out of my Nikon Z7 Mark II at f0.95 no at a 2500th of a second. And actually, okay, bust me. This actually was handheld at ISO 64 with two-thirds of a stop positive exposure compensation. And I'm going to zoom in here. So you can see the sharpness this lens has. This is a beautiful shot because you'll see everything is ridiculously sharp where it's focused. And the background, remembering that this is with a 50 millimeter lens. This is about 10, 15, 20 feet away, like three to five meters or so. And you still lose the background entirely. Here's a real proof of performance shot. Here's a photograph of a bicycle. Now, even the bicycle isn't flat. The bicycle, different parts of the bicycle are several inches or, you know, 10 centimeters closer or further away from the lens and the plane of focus. But I'm zooming in here using my video software again, my editing software to show you how sharp it is. I can read the microscopic print on my back tire way off at the side of the image. This is shot at f0.95 at an 8,000th of a second on my Z7 Mark II at ISO 32, which is a one stop pull with minus one and a third stops exposure compensation because most of the image is fairly dark here. And you'll see that the sharpness is essentially unlimited. Here's some tile. Now, this is not really set up as well as this lens deserves because this isn't even evenly lit. The light's coming from the right-hand side, so the darker left side is just the way the subject looks. It's not the way the lens made any shading on this. I'm zooming in here, and I'm zooming up into the corner. And you can see it's still sharp at f095. The field is flat. This f095 at a thousandth of a second at ISO 64 is plus one-third of a stop exposure compensation. And you need an f095. This is a close shot. These tiles are maybe 10 centimeters or 4 inches or so, very roughly, on the sides on each one. And it's still ultra sharp. Now, of course, if we stop this lens down, it gets even a little bit sharper. F4 is probably about optimum at these close distances. And that tells you a lot. If it starts being dulled by diffraction by F5.6, in other words, we're diffraction limited about F4, that is pretty darn extraordinary, which is, again, what I'd expect from a commercial-grade lens as opposed to a consumer lens. This lens designed pretty much without any limitations, and the fact that it sells for only about $8,000 is a bargain compared to really commercial-grade lenses used in cinema, which were like $30,000 for a fixed lens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for a zoom. This is a bargain for that. This tile, 
This is F4, as I said, at a 50th of a second at ISO 64, and the same plus a third stop exposure compensation. Again, I'm zooming in, and you can see it's, it's sharp without limit off in the corners. Back to my bicycle again, also at F4, at 1 1,000th one of a second at ISO 64 with minus 7 tenth of a stop exposure compensation. Also, the lens is just great for astronomy, but you already knew that. Everybody knew that. Its coma is very limited, very little coma, if any, and honestly, I don't have a clock drive for my lens, so I can't see just how coma-free it is here with astronomical shots. But here's a shot of the night sky in a suburban neighborhood with a lot of light pollution. This is F095 at 10 seconds at ISO 64 with a light value minus 2.8, and even at 10 seconds, the stars are moving. So I can't tell the difference between coma or not. If I was going to photograph cityscapes, you could get a better view of it. But the key is, compared to any other lens, this lens can be considered coma-free. Of course, if you're an astronomer, you people are nuts, and you look at it more closely. But we all know that this O95 lens is a fantastic lens for astronomy. What's new about this lens? Since Nikon's original 58 millimeter f1.2 Noct of 1977, which is this little gem here, these little gems always have sold for about $3,000 a piece. If you adjust their new price for inflation or use today, actually use today, these sell for about $3,800. This new lens is only about half a stop or two-thirds of a stop faster, but it is far more sharp. This original Noct was never that sharp. It was designed for high contrast at f1.2 and no visible coma, so dots stay dots, but ultimately it never gets that sharp. Even stop down, it's not that sharp. It's really designed using the limitations of technology in the 1970s for news gatherers and maybe to some extent astronomers who really had to shoot at f1.2 and needed the most contrasty image with no flare. But ultimately, the spot size, as they say in, in lens design, was never that small. It just was designed so that even the surrounding coma flare would be really packed pretty tightly into the main points of the image. But those points ultimately weren't that small. So there's really no comparison. But... If we want to take a look what's new, this is Nikon's first f0.95 lens. The optics are incredibly superior. It's got space-grade eye of God, most people call this, <laughs> optical performance compared to the old Noct. Oddly, it has the same close focus distance, but a better macro ratio. And we'll see that. This lens focus is pretty close. Not being a macro lens, it gets pretty close, which makes it very useful. It's got a programmable function ring, this rear ring here. It doesn't really do anything useful, and because this ring has no clicks, it doesn't really serve much purpose because if you're trying to set apertures, I don't know about you guys, but I need clicks, so I can just count clicks. There's a programmable lens function button, which you can program in your camera to do many things. It also has a foolish OLED display, which you can control with this. Because its display doesn't stay on all the time, it's this little window here. It's really just a gimmick. It doesn't do anything useful. It can read out the focus distance, which we can also read on the scale, or read out the set aperture, and eh, that's about it. It can also show you a depth of field scale, but unfortunately, what they really should have done is put the depth of field scale engraved here, and it would have been useful for a lot of calculations you could do, like optimum apertures with different focus distances, and I have a whole article on how to do that. In other words, if you're trying to shoot something, what's the optimum aperture to get the best depth of field and the best sharpness, considering diffraction? They uh, didn't do that. This also claims to be drip and dust resistant. Good luck on that. It has an 11-blade electronic diaphragm as opposed to the nine or seven blade diaphragm of the original Noct. And of course it has a whopping big non-removable tripod collar. The tripod collar has no clicks, but it does have 90 degree indices. And it does have a locking ring here, which is pretty nice. It's a nice smooth lock, so you can tighten it down. It'll lock solid, but it doesn't click or anything. And also hidden, there's the only plastic on the lens is this little flippy cap here, which will probably fall off with use. And there's a Kensington lock there. So if you're using this in a school, maybe good luck on that. I'm going to get into every specific aspect of performance in this video, but of course it has outstanding optics, it's ultra fast, outstanding sharpness, it has a very flat field, it has no visible distortion, even at f095 the fall off is minimal compared to other lenses like this which usually have a lot of fall off. It's excellent at close distances as well. Its performance does not fall off because as I'll show you, the optical design self-optimizes itself. It has really nice 22-point sun stars when stops it down. It's got direct mechanical manual focus. It's not one of these wishy-washy electronic focus ring things that never really work well. Admittedly, for manual focus, the 50 f1.2 seems like a good idea, but it's not because this lens, there's always a time delay like all these mirrorless systems. There's, there's just a fraction of a second delay from when you turn this electronic encoder until the lens actually focuses. And good luck doing that. It drives you nuts. This is a direct, mechanical, manual ring. 
responds instantly to your focus commands. This works great with all the manual focus tools in the Z cameras. For instance, my Z7.2 has color changing focus areas, as well as a very precise three dot null system for manual focus. And of course, there's <laughs> you can enlarge the image as well as have focus peaking. This is all metal construction and it is quality made domestically in Japan. The 50 F1.2 for a quarter of the price. The externals are mostly plastic and Nikon dumped production out to Thailand. So this is a consumer lens. This is a commercial grade lens made the way it should be. And what really is encouraging about this is it shows you Nikon can do whatever they want. They make consumer grade stuff today and they offshore it and it's really sad that they do, but uh, they try to make it for a reasonable price. This thing is designed for traditional Nikon shooters that remembered the old days when things were all quality made in Japan out of all metal. What's bad? Well, as I said, it is manual focus only. It's not a practical lens. It's not for consumer use handheld. The cam-based focus system works magnificently well. It optimizes itself at every distance. At least I believe it's a cam-based. But when you do this, it's not as smooth and devoid of play mechanically as all of Nikon's manual focus traditional lenses were. But so what? This is a lens for business, not for play. Of course, it's huge, it's super heavy, and it's $8,000, which are disadvantages. What's missing? There's no image stabilization. Well, so what? It's designed for use in a tripod. And oddly, you know what is missing? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. There's no Arca Swiss dovetail on this tripod mount. The $18 tripod mount I'm used to hold my iPhone to shoot this video has an Arca Swiss dovetail built in, but <laughs> this $8,000 lens does not. Something tells me it's probably a patent and trademark issue rather than something else. But the problem is if you're going to shoot this with an Arca Swiss head, like probably half of you are, you still have to go out and buy an Arca Swiss plate. What's really nice is manual focus is a dream. Look how precise this is. If you focus manually for a while, look at how far away this is. This lens turns 345 degrees just to get down to half a meter. But it's also double the diameter of a regular lens, which gives an extraordinary amount of probably four times as much precision as a traditional manual focus lens from Nikon. And the beauty of that is when you're shooting this on a tripod and magnified and trying to set focus exactly, it's a beautiful thing. And that's what really impresses you about owning this lens versus just reading about it, is when you sit this thing on your tripod, you lock it down, you move your focus area over to where you want to focus, it is so smooth and sweet. It's a wonderful thing. There's also no focus shift. Something only old timers remember. That's when you focus the lens at full aperture, then stop it down. Older lenses with spherical aberration would sometimes shift their focus point a little bit, meaning that the point of optimum focus would move forward or back a little bit, which would be bad because you really would have to refocus. Electronic cameras, DSLRs have corrected for that in the background where you didn't know it. But the beauty is this lens, I don't see any focus shift. I can focus at 095 and shot at smaller apertures. It's still dead on. Focus breathing. The image gets a little larger as focused more closely. Now, let me show you how the optics work on this. It comes with a beautiful solid alloy hood with a rubber bumper. And I always shoot the lens with this on. It doesn't protect much against stray light, but it protects the lens against bumps and knocks. What's odd about this hood is that you'd figure it have engraved markings. No. This is actually, I believe, paint. These are raised slightly. I think this is paint, oddly enough. How it focuses. When you focus, the back optics don't move. What happens is the front section moves out. Now, this is a clever design because this front section would be extremely delicate. If you drop this lens or bonked it on something, you potentially could damage the internal cams or whatever's moving in there, cams and followers. But it's actually protected within the outer barrel. So this hood will protect that from getting damaged if you bang it on something. But the beauty of it is these optics are moving in and out as focused, the back or not. This design self-optimizes, so it's always got the optimum performance. There may be more than just one focus group inside the lens. That I don't know. But because that front section moves out, there is a little bit of focus breathing, meaning the image grows slightly as focused more closely. The nice thing is if you're using this for cinematography, this outer ring here, you can put this on a follow focus rig. It should work really well. Okay is awesome. If we take a look at some images here, these are from about headshot distance for a person, or this owl, of course, a little bit smaller. At the largest apertures where it matters, here's f095. The background totally goes away, but you expected that. Here's at f1. Background totally goes away. At f14, background goes away real well. By the time you get to f2, the bokeh is neutral. In other words, you essentially have just plain neutral blur circles. They're not blurry at the sides, they're just blur circles. At the medium apertures, as we're going up here, here's f2.8, f4. 
the bouquet is not all that awesome. And actually, it gets fairly poor at the smallest apertures. It's really bad at f11 and f16 because if I zoom in, as I'm doing again, this is electronic zooming in my video editing software. <laughs> it's no other kind of zoom. You'll notice the blur circles really get a little bit lighter on the edge of the circle and emphasize that, so that's bad. Distortion? I can't see any distortion at all, although if I really look too closely, uh, you know, blow it up 300% and go out of my way to turn off the distortion correction in the camera, I would use a factor of minus 0.5 in Photoshop's lens correction filter, but then there is a little bit of waviness. So again, just leave the distortion correction on in the camera and it'll correct. And if you turn it off to avoid any resampling issues, then still no visible amount of distortion. The amount of distortion it has is completely invisible to the naked eye, unless you go out of your way to shoot test targets and blow it up 300% to put a straight line against it. Ergonomics, well, they're good knowing what this lens is for. This is for use on a tripod. Then the whole front half of the lens is the focus ring. So it's really good. The tripod collar works brilliantly. The only issue is that these edges of this manual focus thing are sharp. If you can see here, they're actually triangular shapes. The tops are sharp. And so use over time may wear your fingers out. So watch out. The OLED is easy to use. Just push the display button. The problem is it goes off after a few moments. So it's a gimmick rather than a real useful function. Fall off. This is shot on my Z7 Mark II with vignette control left at normal. And left at normal, this is not any significant fall off. I'm exaggerating this by shooting a gray field. You won't see it this bad in pictures. And for a lens like this, this is negligible. If I go out of my way to turn off vignette control and then go looking for fall off, which is one of the dumbest things you could do, I'm impressed because if you have experience with lenses like this, it's unusual that they have this little fall off. Usually these ultra speed lenses cheat in their designs and become much slower due to mechanical vignetting off in the corners, which keeps them sharper and has less coma in the corners, but it also means they're a lot slower in the corners. This lens, again, I'm really impressed. There's not that much mechanical vignetting compared to what I'm used to. For filters, that's interesting. It's marked 82 millimeters and this hood is marked 82, but the hood isn't 82. The hood, I didn't actually measure this that precisely other than with the ruler, but this is a 97 millimeter thread. And this hood is actually about 97 millimeters. This smaller internal thread here, that's the 82 millimeter thread for the filter. Now how I use this lens is I always leave this hood on and then I just use a 95 millimeter clip in these are spring-loaded, and so this fits on here real nice. If you want to use a filter, then you have to take the hood off and stick the filter in. I'd be real careful with my filters, though, but we'll cover that at the very end. Flare and ghosts are extremely well-controlled, and we'll see that when we get to the section on sun stars. I can't see any lateral color fringes when shot as JPEGs on Nikon, which has always, well, since 2007, has always corrected for them automatically. I can't tell, and I can't warrant that if you shoot in RAW, then open the images with non-Nikon software that maybe there's some correction going on that you can't see. But overall, I doubt that there's any lateral colors. Lens corrections are the same as for every other lens. My Z7 Mark II and all the other ones that I've tested recently have corrections for distortion, diffraction, and fall off. And you can turn any of those on or off. And the lateral color correction is always active on all the Nikons made since 2007. There's no control for that. Let's look at macro. What impresses me is how ridiculously sharp this lens is, even at f095, even shot at its closest focus distance. Here's my watch, and I'm zooming in here with video editing software. It's not the lens zooming in. And you'll see it's actually really sharp and free from spherical aberration getting close. There is some spherochromatism, which is when things get out of focus, they take on slight color fringes, but I'll show that a little bit later. And that's why the hand, the minute hand here is soft because it's not in focus. The depth of field is like a tenth of a millimeter at this distance. And if we stop it down, it gets sharper, but every lens does that. The key is that if you want to shoot it at 095 for macro, you can get results that good. When you shake it, what noises does it make? You know, it turns out that's one surprising thing about this lens is it can make some noise. Let's see if I can get it to make some noise here. Do you hear that clunking? What that is, is the front optics are actually spring-loaded onto a cam. It's not a helicoid, as best I can feel. So you can actually pull this front section out. This pulls out a little bit because it's spring-loaded pushing it back that way. So if you shake it, it can lose itself this way and rattle around. So the 
advice is don't do that. There is some spherochromatism, but I don't think you'll ever see it because everything is so far out of focus, the spherochromatism won't be visible because spherochromatism is really only visible in a very narrow range of just being slightly off focus. So if I zoom into this photograph of my watch, which is just a little bit not straight onto the camera, you'll notice the left side, which is a little further away, takes on green fringes, and the right side, which is a little closer to the lens, in other words, not in focus, it's ahead of the focus plane, gets some magenta fringes. So this is classic spherochromatism, but I don't think you'll ever see it except for this one test where I went out of my way knowing what I was doing. There's no stabilization. It will work with Nikon's built-in stabilization. Here we go for Sunstars. These are full-frame shots at the various apertures. Ignore the slight vertical smear at the large apertures if you're going to shoot at F1 or point it directly at the sun in the middle of the day. That's called interline transfer smear. That's an artifact of the camera. And as I get to the smaller apertures, the 11 blade diagram begets some nice 22 point sun stars, but really only at the smallest apertures. And I am really impressed. When we mentioned flare, lenses this complicated usually are loaded with, well, not loaded with flare, but they have a decent healthy amount of flare. I can see almost no flare. The red and green dots you see are artifacts of the sensor and the sensor wells. The really only flare blobs I see is, is one purple blob right in the middle of the frame. And I'm impressed because other than that, there's nothing, which is why overall this lens, Nikon pulled out all the stops and they're giving us a $30,000 lens for only $8,000. That's what impresses me. The tripod collar I mentioned before, there's no click stops. It only has a quarter 20 socket on it. There's no three eighths inch socket. Let's compare it. I think I've done this before. Most people, the most intelligent purchase is get the 50 millimeter F1.2. Yes, it's cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. It's more cheaply made. It's offshore to Thailand. It's mostly plastic. The optics are just as good. No, it's only a half a stop as fast. Sorry about that. And manual focus is not quite as elegant as with the other lens. But let's see if I put them next to each other here. You see, I can't even fit the other one in the frame. This is a much more practical lens. Weighs half as much, coarse a quarter as much. And you can handhold it. It works great. The original Noct is a collectible. And I never really had that much respect for it. It's a special purpose lens. It was never that sharp for general photography. People faint though. They're like, oh, the knocked. In fact, Nikon even tries to play up the aura of this lens in selling this lens, claiming that this lens is like, you know, an imitator. No, the original knocked was okay. It was great for manual focus cameras. And actually, this is a more active lens. You can take this out and shoot this handheld. This is a great lens for news and reporting. But that was back from the days of film when we actually needed F1.2 to see anything and anything other than full sunlight. A much more practical lens is this. This is the old AFS G 50 millimeter F1.4. No, it doesn't have the stellar optics, but it's just about as fast. And if you use on the FTZ adapter, this whole thing can, you can get for about $500, including the adapter, for one quarter of the price of this giant F1.2. And <laughs> this is an extremely practical lens to use on the Z cameras. No, it's not as insanely sharp if you're going to shoot at f1.4 and shoot test targets and look off in the corners. But if you do that, you're an idiot because the best way to shoot a test target is to put it in a flatbed scanner, which you can get for $50 as part of a combo fax telephone <laughs> scanner printer and get even sharper results. If we compare it to the Nikon Z 50 millimeter f1.8, the Z50 1.8 also is a much more practical lens. It's just as sharp. It's just not as fast. And it has autofocus. And for most people, much more practical lens. If you just want great bokeh, get the Z 85mm f1.8, which at f1.8, standing a little further away with greater magnification, has about the same shallow depth of field as the f095 does. If you want to compare it to the Canon 50mm f1.0, well, the Canon 50mm f1.0 came out in 1989. The optics are nowhere near as extraordinary as this lens. However, the Canon lens autofocuses, weighs a lot less, and sells for half as much. So the Canon lens actually does make some sense for handheld shooting, which this lens does not. But also the Canon lens, actually with the Fringer EF to Z adapter, can be shot on the Z cameras, but it's a clunky thing. I, I would by all means get the Nikon 50 f1.2 instead of trying to get the Canon lens to shoot on a Nikon camera. If you want to compare it to the Canon RF 50 f1.2, the RF 50 f1.2 is optically superb, just as good as either of these two lenses. The thing is, honestly, it only shoots on Canon cameras, so you'd have to upgrade to a Canon camera versus a Nikon camera. You can't adapt the Canon mirrorless lenses to any other kind of camera. If we want to talk about filters, 
Something to watch out for filters is even my best filters sometimes aren't perfectly flat when shot on this lens. The way to test a filter is to look through one side of a binocular or look through a spotting scope, focus on something, and then hold the filter over the front of the spotting scope or binocular. If it's a good filter, there will be no change at all to the image. And if the filter is just a little bit bad, the image will look horrible through the binocular. You can test on a camera using this lens, simply set it to f one 5 have it on a tripod, focus it on something, zoom it in inside the camera, then hold your filter. Don't screw the filter on because that'll shift the lens and maybe shift focus. Just hold the filter over the front. And if anything changes, anything gets a little blurry, it's a bad filter. If it looks fine, then you're fine. So there's no mysteries of that. For tripod heads, I love my Manfrotto 410, also known as a Bogan 3275 geared head which sells for maybe around $400. And I'll have a link for this in the description. That way, when you use the thing in a tripod, you can very precisely micro fine adjust with little worm gears up, down, left, right, and get the precise framing you want. So that's it. This lens is a lens for people who deserve the best. If you're a collector, get them now while you can. It comes in this huge case. Not that you need it, but it is a wonderful case. And if you look at my unboxing video, you can see all everything you get with this lens in, in glowing details. This is a lens for organizations, not so much for individuals. It's a lens for rich individuals who like to shoot on a tripod and shoot very slowly. And really, if you're making images that are going to be important 100 years from now, by all means, use this lens. If you're reproducing fine art that's been important for hundreds of years, if you're a museum trying to conserve and get the most accurate images possible, by all means, get this lens. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's cleared up some mysteries of what this thing is. It's really nothing to be afraid of. It's just not intended for general use. It is intended for organizational use. And for those applications, it's really quite a lens. I'd have to applaud Nikon. Originally, I was kind of ticked off thinking they've wasted their resources developing this lens and they could have put their money into making something we actually needed for their Z cameras. But they actually did something that they used to do, which is make an extraordinary lens for very special purposes. And I have to applaud them for that. So thanks again for watching Ken Rockwell, kenrockwell.com and kenrockwell.tv.